Okay, we come now to the panel discussion. I would like to ask Turaj to come back on scene while I introduce our two other panelists. One is Sarah Sermondada. She's a science journalist and deputy editor at Heidi News. Welcome, Sarah. You worked for several years as an engineer before moving into science journalism. Take whatever seat you prefer. And you graduated at INSA Lyon in engineering, then in Paris in management, and then in Lille in science journalism. So you have an understanding for management, science, and communication. Welcome to the stage. And Carl, attacking from the back. <laughs> Carl Aber, a professor also at EPFL, like Turaj, in the School of Computer Science as well. His research interests are on foundations, algorithms, infrastructures for distributed information, also semantic interoperability that we heard. And he's also the co-founder of LinkAlong, a startup established in 2017, which provides open source document analytics, and which I used myself, and I appreciate it a lot, also at EPFL. So I can, I, I can recommend it. Welcome, Carl, as well. And we were supposed to have, they're preparing behind, or next to me, we we're supposed to have a fourth guest, Philipp Stoll, responsible for di digital transformation and data partnership at ICRC, Croix Rouge, Red Cross, IKRK. But of course, the invasion of Russia into Ukraine happened and he had to take a plane and leave to Ukraine for his job. But uh, he left us a video and we would like to start with his video, which will put us directly into discussion, I guess, afterwards. Good morning, this is Philippe Stoll. I'm working for the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, it's Wednesday, uh, 8 o'clock. I'm about to leave for Ukraine, and um, I was meant to be with you uh, this afternoon uh, for the discussion on uh, artificial intelligence and um, mass manipulation. Unfortunately, I will be in a plane going to Ukraine, as I said, and uh, I will be uh, unfortunately unable to, to participate to the discussion. But I just wanted to uh, film this small video just to give you a, a little bit of a background and, and a few uh, elements maybe that you can discuss during, uh, during your session. Um, it's unfortunate because I was really looking forward to, uh, to be discussing and engaging with you um, because of the topic which is, which is highly um, highly urgent and highly timely, I would say. I think most of you have seen that the International Committee of the Red Cross has been subject to quite several attacks uh, today of misinformation, um, misunderstanding, etc. And um, we can see today uh, really the impact on the field. Some of our colleagues uh, have been uh, kind of verbally attacked, even physically, in Ukraine but also on, on social media and, uh, and different medium where uh, we have been uh, harshly attacked. I think the discussion of today, uh, I'm, I'm sure, could, could highlight some of these elements. And uh, in that sense, uh, I hope uh, there will be some element uh, dur during the exchange between, uh, between all of you. Um, if the question of the impact on an organization such as the ICRC uh, regarding misinformation or hate speech, etc., is, is pretty obvious, I'm going there uh, also for another reason which is also related to misinformation, disinformation and hate speech, and uh, that relates to the impact on people who are uh, facing uh, the conflict, people affected by the war. And I think this is something which is maybe less known or less uh, tangible, less visible, but this is something we, where the International Committee of the Red Cross is very concerned and very worried. To which extent, uh, as a person who is uh, right now hiding in a basement, knows exactly what he or she can do based on the information that they can find on uh, either social media or traditional media. So this is something which is uh, very, uh, very worrying, as I said, because it's, it's complicated to find um, uh, the direct link or situations where ourselves, um, how to say, the impact, the physical impact is not that obvious. When you don't know if you can go to a hospital or if you can't go outside your basement to find uh, your drugs, etc., because you don't know if there is landmines, you don't know if um, what is on the news is the correct information, if it's safe or not safe uh, to go out, or when uh, some um, 
uh, parties to the conflict are trying to ma manipulate public opinion to create fear. Uh, the consequences, as I said, physically are, are difficult to, to measure, but also the, the psychological dimension is, is very, very complex. Uh, to which extent people living in fear because of, of misinformation, manipulation, etc., uh, is, is, is uh, related to, uh, to that. And um, yeah, I wish you a, a fruitful discussion. I'm, I'm, I'll, be, uh, I'll be connected, I guess, uh, when I will be uh, in Ukraine and uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hear the, the, the discussion and especially the dimension with AI because so far what we know is, is somehow man-made or human-made uh, but when a deep fake or the means will, will become much more um, mainstream and when AI will come into the mix when we will have uh, official messages from one party or another or from, from a humanitarian organization which is a deep fake, this is going to become very, very worrying. So I wish you all the best for, uh, for, for, for the conference and really looking forward to engage with you uh, uh, one day or another. Take care. Bye. Is Philip online with us? He said he's connected. No, okay. I also wanted to thank him. Okay. Well, uh, Yes, so you saw, we're right into it. Uh, many, many topics uh, that we can discuss. Maybe I'll start right away with you, Karl, uh, because it's ICRC, you collaborate with them. He said they had multiple attacks. Uh, maybe you can elaborate a bit more on that element before you move more into misinformation and war. Yeah, okay, so let me jump directly into that. Um, yeah, it is one of the things I wanted to mention, actually, in this panel, uh, we have, uh, been starting to work last year on, on a project uh, to exactly help uh, using AI to analyze uh, information that comes from social media and that represents, uh, if you like, attacks or misinformation about ICRC or in general humanitarian organizations. And um, I mean, the idea is that exactly what uh, Philip just mentioned to uh, support analysts uh, in, in the task of understanding this information because you know, uh, today this is typically done in a very manual way, uh, and this of course gives some results, but it's le laborious. It's probably not very efficient, and uh, we want to see how we can use AI to kind of optimize this process. And it seems at the first glance to be a fairly simple problem, right? Uh, you, you, when we're talking about, let's say, uh, 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 let's say reputation attacks on the ICRC, uh, you would go into the social media, you would probably recover anything that is mentioning ICRC. Uh, you try to classify it using some standard AI, saying, okay, this is a very negative sentiment in this message, so it must be an attack on the ICRC. So uh, you can try this, but uh, you will immediately see that it does not work, because uh, since ICRC is working in context like in the Ukraine, uh, everything that is said and mentions ICRC is negative, without ICRC being the target. It could be even a very positive, uh, if you say uh, ICRC is helping in this disaster situation, it is generally a negative connotation, but uh, it's not ICRC who is creating the disaster, right? Um, uh, unless it's misinformation. So um, it turns out that it's a much harder task uh, uh, to do it, uh, even with now uh, major advantages as that we have seen in, in the use of uh, uh, deep neural networks for natural language processing, etc. Um, uh, but you have to really get a much deeper understanding of the text. It's already hard to identify the entities that are mentioned because people are not so nice to mention ICRC exactly with the acronym in every text. Uh, it turns out this is already in social media a hard task, uh, but there we make some progress now. Uh, and then it's very hard to identify what is the meaning of the text, right? Because uh, who is the target of the negative sentiment, for example? So that's uh, something. Or what is the type of attack? Because it's not, not only that people are explicitly uh, 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 blaming someone or something like that. It is often very hidden uh, in the meaning. And so uh, how, how do we characterize, classify the different types of attacks? So these are the typical questions we're working on at the moment. Uh, uh, progress is a, a slow. We're a little bit late for this uh, crisis, of course. Uh, it will give us, of course, also a lot to learn about the problem because now it, there are massive attacks underway. And so, uh, yeah, we will see uh, how far we can push it. But overall, uh, I hope that really we can uh, really kind of 
save human time in, ana in analysis. We cannot get rid of it, obviously, but uh, uh, it is, uh, as in most of the situations, it is a mix of uh, uh, human and machine intelligence that can uh, produce the best results. Thanks a lot. Can I ask, how long have you been working with the ICRC? I mean, uh, we have been working in various projects now since uh, already seven, eight years, uh, but this is one that started more recently in the past year. Thanks a lot. Maybe I come to, to Raj and then to you, Sarah. So uh, again, we're in conflict. Uh, you mentioned in your talk, uh, conflicts unfortunately have always existed. Manipulation of images have always existed. So maybe you can expand a bit on this. What do you, how do you see this evolution? Yeah, so... I mean, you uh, showed us an image of Abraham Lincoln that is fake news already, so... Yeah, that, that wasn't a conflict necessarily, but no, in fact, during the uh, um, the Second World War, when uh, Russian soldiers, they, they took uh, Reichstag in Berlin, um, there were, of course, you know, always media has been accompanying soldiers, right, in every war. And uh, there, they, there are actually many cases where um, photographers with their... 1940s technologies uh, took pictures of the soldiers and some of them have been looting and uh, had uh, seven, eight uh, watches on, on, each, uh, on each wrist. And, uh, but then they had to be used also for, for um, propaganda, you could say it, um, um, in a way, uh, to show that, uh, yes, the, the Russian soldiers are great and they have liberated um, uh, Germany uh, from Nazis, but uh, but then these soldiers uh, uh, with with seven or eight watches on each wrist doesn't give a very good impression, right? So at that time, um, even with the limited uh, information and uh, in limited knowledge about how to how to manipulate uh, these photographs, uh, they were actually uh, uh, forged. You could say uh, they were changed. Uh, to, to raise the, the watches. They, they, it goes back even um, to, to 40s, and uh, in fact, as of last week, uh, I'm sure many of you already know, uh, and uh, fortunately, it was very badly done, uh, but there was a deep fake of, uh, of the president of uh, uh, Ukraine uh, that, uh, that was very intelligently, by the way, placed in the, in the website of some uh, TV or uh, uh, news uh, um, uh, outlet uh, where he was basically telling uh, uh, Ukrainians and uh, soldiers, uh, Ukrainian soldiers, to just, you know, uh, uh, stop the conflict, uh, put down your weapons, uh, there has been enough, enough death, and uh, we should just stop. And ju it took only a couple of days more uh, for the opposite to happen, and it this time was the Russian president who, who was who was deep faked where uh, where uh, he did say the same thing by saying you know uh, let's have peace so we uh, uh, Russian soldiers uh, you know don't don't uh, just go back just put your weapons and then come back home don't don't uh, don't uh, don't advance anymore so it has been used and it is being used uh, so this is this is a fact there is no doubt about it now the question is how to deal with it right. Um, um, I don't know if you want me <laughs> to, to tell to tell you a few words about that now. Maybe I, I actually, when you when you had a one to one, uh, you also mentioned an example which is not everything is deep fake, right? There was also this example about the Snake Island, and I was wondering if this is still going on because this was not a created uh, thing, mm -hmm. but it was a, a misinformation. I think Maybe can you uh, can you elaborate on that or is, how does this evolve? Because it also shows an, a light on afterwards going towards journalism in the speed the heat of the battle, deciding what is right or wrong, sometimes yeah. without having a fake image, just the news. That's true. So, you know, there are, there are also, because the, the, the fundamental problem is that once everybody can really create something that can be potentially fake, then you have uh, this phenomenon some people refer to as um, the liar's dividend. So even if, you know, when you have an information, well, you know, the if it's really somebody can always say no, it's a deep fake, and uh, if even you get a politician or an individual in act with video and pictures and and all sorts of uh, evidence in form of um, multimedia content, they can always deny it by saying this is a very well done uh, deep fake. And there are many many examples of also that, right? Now I'm not going to give you the, the example you gave, but maybe a new one. Um, in in fact, uh, in 
in, in, in an African country, I think it was Gabon, if I'm not wrong, a couple of years ago, um, uh, the president uh, basically apparently had a, had a heart attack or some stroke and uh, he was incapable of, of, of running his duties and uh, it seems that there is something like uh, some sort of law that says after six weeks if the president cannot uh, you know, fulfill it, uh, his or her duties, uh, th there should be elections. And uh, so nobody even knows to, de to, de to date today. Um, whether uh, 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 whether this happened or not, but uh, they had to show the president um, in a very strange, so it was not even a good deep fake. So a lot of people were saying, but this seems to be a deep fake. But then some others they said, and they bring it, brought in some, some, some doctors who said, no, no, he had a stroke, that's why he, he half of his face doesn't move and he, 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 he talks strangely and so you know, th so so uh, so it, in in a way, um, a lot of people think that we are not really in the in the era of 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 deep fakes that are so realistic that we don't know. But maybe we have been because we will never know it, right? We will never know it. Good deep fakes um, that have accomplished their mission, they have they have gone unnoticed. So how do you know? If some of the things that we have seen, including this this uh, this uh, this example I gave you, have been a deepfake or not, and even to date, nobody really knows whether that particular video was a deepfake or not, because uh, some experts they say it is, some experts say it's not. Different experts they have different opinions, so you know it's it's really a confusion, right? So uh, so that's 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 really probably the biggest impact. The biggest impact is not whether we can and with which percentage detect a forgery or not, is that um, we are really starting a new era where, where even the truth, regardless whether there are deep fakes and forgeries or not, the truth can be put in question because truth can be easily manipulated. Thank you. Maybe pass on to Sarah. Whew. The truth, right? You're a journalist, and uh, as we see in conflict, it gets accelerated. Mm. And you hear uh, Philip saying that people need to understand if they can go out or not. There are landmines that the media, per definition, the word itself, medium, should bring them the message. Mm. How uh, what, yeah, how yeah, what was interesting, uh, I think, is uh, media is very important in times of peace or <laughs> of uttermost importance in times of war, as we've seen in Ukraine and Russia, because uh, media outlets in uh, Russia are just closing the one after the others because there is this new law. You don't have the, the you, you can't talk about war. You have to, to, to mention a special operation. So th you, you probably know the Novaya Gazeta, which is a very known uh, media outlet in Russia. Th they closed a few years ago. So this is, of course, very concerning because what do you do if you cannot you, you don't know who, who you can trust. I think this is the role of journalism uh, in, a, in, a, yes, in a broad way, just to, 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 to tell the audience what you can trust, and that's our role. Um, I, my, myself, I'm not a war reporter. What I, what, can, when I ca what I can talk about is the pandemics, because I happen to be a science journalist, and we've seen a lot of crazy things with the, the pandemics during the last two years, so what I can say is that we, we journalists, have also the duty to to open the black box and just to explain how do we work. Because during the pandemics, some people told us, why do you keep talking about, let's say, uh, how do the lo lockdown uh, the lockdowns work, and why don't you talk more about uh, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, of uh, such uh, so-called cure, bec because they were supposed to work from s for some people. Even uh, even if uh, some uh, some uh, trials uh, never shown that they worked, so it all comes down to what is a reliable uh, source of information. Of course, a tweet is not per se uh, a trustable source of information. We've seen that uh, there can be deep fakes. Uh, multimedia information is not uh, <laughs> always reli reliable. So we we have to find some. We have to cross check, and we have to to go back to the primary source. And for us science journalist, it is 
two things. Uh, it is the scientific publications, and it is, of course, the researchers themselves. But there are many traps because um, the scientific publication has to be peer-reviewed by other scientists. There are some many levels of proof because sometimes you happen to see something that looks like a correlation, but it's not. It's just. It's, it's not a correla correlation. It's just uh, some some uh, random. Uh, you just you just happen to observe something random, and the science the scientific um, uh, the scientific themselves. Uh, they, they are just uh, people. Uh, the scientific. The science is not an ivory tower, and sometimes it's not separated from society. So we've seen many, many crazy things during uh, this, pan this pandemic. And it's not because, um, the, the I, I just want to go maybe a bit further uh, in my example about chloroquine. When you are a journalist, if you are a science journalist, you, 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 you know you have to be careful when there is a, uh, a scientist uh, speaking alone, uh, we, who seems to disagree with uh, his other co-workers, so you, you, you know you have to be careful. But sometimes when you're not specialized, you just go, okay, so he's maybe he's saying uh, interesting things, he's, he, he looks like an expert, so let's uh, give him, give him the, 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 the mic. And, uh, so you, you, you have to be careful and just to, to go, to go um, into the um, scientific community, and not only uh, one specific person. Marseille as well. As well. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So it's a tricky job, and uh, of course, this is all relying. In s I think science journalism is a good example because we have science behind. We can rely on science. It's already a, a critical spirit, and we have access to the information. But now, as we heard, sometimes maybe, and also the title of the session says it, we are into mass manipulation. So we don't even know maybe that there are other sources. We are maybe in a, in a complete bubble. And so maybe, Carl, you can develop more on this. You're investigating this phenomenon also, and I think you also, I'll give you my mic. You also investigate this, I think, also in Turkey. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> that's, um, I mean, we have been talking a lot about misinformation in terms of uh, fake news, fake videos, so basically placing falsified pieces of information. But the phenomenon is in, is in, very, in, in reality much bigger and much diverse, and uh, there are some uh, more surprising instances of uh, how, uh, uh, media are man manipulated, particularly social media. So, and so this is relates to uh, some work of one of my PhD students, who happens to be from Turkey. So he started to look at Twitter trends in Turkey. So th you know, probably Twitter trends are these hashtags uh, that are particularly popular, and of course, everyone who sees those hashtags believes these are the important topics, something like that. Now, in Twitter, basis uh, these Twitter trends basically on how often these hashtags are being used. Now, what he discovered was kind of pretty so amazing. Uh, in Turkey, he discovered that there exists a sort of a tax where people essentially have uh, access to corrupted accounts where they place posts with hashtags. The text is totally irrelevant. This is just uh, gibberish. And uh, immediately after posting, they delete it again, because on Twitter you can also delete the messages. So the o true owners often, they don't even notice that their account has been used to place those messages. So they look kind of very credible because they come from normal accounts. And so the, with this mechanism, now you think this is some small thing, it's not. Uh, they, they managed to boost about 30, 45% of the trends in Turkey were fake. No one knew about this. So there have been social scientists writing articles about social phenomena in Turkey that were totally misled by uh, this data, which is totally fake. And Turkey is one of the biggest Twitter communities. I don't remember, even on the global level, this is in the almost double-digit percentage uh, of the trends that have been manipulated. So it is, it's, uh, by the way, we informed Twitter. Twitter said that's none of our problem and so on. Um, but. Um, this shows that the things come from very surprising angles that you would even not expect. And uh, these are other realities, right? So it's not only the picturing of the tr physical reality. This is a virtual reality that exists and people take serious and can be manipulated like that. Incredible. So this is all done, I guess, with some scripts, algorithms, bots. Uh, technically, technically very, very basic. Exactly. So that leads me to bots. I think we also had discussions. I think Turaj, I'll ask you. I think you, you t mentioned once uh, that there is some s science uh, telling us that, again, the dividends liar, I guess, that fake news spread quicker also, that also boosted by bots. Can you elaborate on that? 
Yeah. So you know there are many reasons for that. So there are two studies I want to uh, mention. One is a little bit old, a few years old, that basically a researcher from MIT they uh, they they made a study and they found out that uh, fake news uh, spreads not only in terms of images or video, etc., just even text. It spreads much faster. Uh, I think it's six or seven times even faster. So it's significantly faster than uh, than, than real news. Um, a, a more recent study has shown that um, um, if you make fake people, so people who do not exist and they are being used a lot in publicity and a lot of uh, other uh, other areas, people seem to trust more. And this one is uh, much more recent from Berkeley. People seem to trust much more the fake faces than the real people's faces. They find them more trustworthy. Back to politics. Uh, maybe, yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, so whatever the reason, it, there, 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 there is some fascination, right, that exists apparently with, uh, with these uh, fake uh, contents, be it text or audio or, or video, images, pictures, etc. cetera. And, um, and, uh, and that, that is making the, the phenomenon uh, much more complicated. And indeed, I agree with uh, Carl, that uh, the phenomenon is much more complex, uh, not only from technical point of view, but from other points of view, right? So I, 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 I think maybe it's, uh, it would be useful to a little bit debate that more. It's technology definitely is not the only solution. And, and there are other things beyond technology that we need in order to resolve or at least reduce, maybe we cannot resolve it completely, but at least reduce the impact, the negative impact of, of, of disinformation and misinformation. Thank you. So uh, fake news, bad news spread quicker. Uh, yes. Sarah, yes, uh, press's role of the press. Yes, you're right. Uh, I think the example of the, um, the MIT study is a really good one because we, 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 see, we see it quite often because there is something going on in the internet and we, we, we're just asking ourselves, oh, sh should we do a debunk? And sometimes we just the, the, the time we take thinking about it, it's gone. And so, and so the day after, we're just uh, saying ourselves, okay, so we are not going to talk about it because we, we, the risk is to draw attention to, to some, some, some things that doesn't deserve such attention. And maybe the, 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 the people behind the agenda is to, to, to make people, to make the media talk about it, even if it's not that interesting. So, uh, but in some other instances, when we do some debunks, some really important debunks, we, we've seen that debunks as well doesn't travel, don't travel uh, as fast as <laughs> the first information that has to be debunked. So it's like a race, and we 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 have to do it. And I have to say that debunk uh, is quite a new genre of journalism because uh, before uh, debunks were. We, uh, there were th th there were debunk in every article because everything was sourced. But now we have um, we have some some things going very going on very quickly on uh, the internet and social networks, and we have to to, to keep uh, to keep track with it. And at the same time, we don't want to to to, to publish something if we haven't the time to cross check it. So so this is quite tricky. And in my field, science journalism, we take the time to, to cross-check, but uh, sometimes it can be tricky, and we've seen with the war in Ukraine that we have to be extra careful just to, to pay attention to whose side information is coming, and yes. Thank you. Carl, maybe, so fake news spread faster, is this a full story, or is there other parameters? Uh, yeah, I know this. Uh, I, I'm not yet sure because there are many. I mean, there are many uh, uh, such uh, studies that have been made. That then, in a later study, uh, you can show also the opposite. This reminds me a bit of medicine. Um, um, but uh, coming back to the debunking and science journalism, uh, so we 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 had so quite some work in this area. Um, and so the idea was uh, in, indeed basically to automate, so to say, the process of going from uh, scientific news to the original article, basically, which has a lot of technical questions. How do you find the articles, et cetera, et cetera. 
but uh, uh, the, the ultimate goal was kind of then to find ways to distinguish basically credible from non-credible news articles. And um, so we had one major failure in this project that was when we wanted to uh, find ground truths and ask scientists to evaluate news articles, we didn't, didn't get any response. So we didn't get any ground truths. So we had to work with very limited data in a way, but we had also a positive outcome there. And uh, so what we could show essentially in a nutshell was that uh, if we take news articles and we extract a couple of indicators that you can automatically extract, uh, that kind of are signals for quality, non-experts make a much better job in distinguishing, uh, uh, let's say, credible from non-credible news. So in a sense, you can even avoid the experts because statistically, you will already much improve the situation. So this is, in principle, something that could be done about the problem. Thank you. And there's a question in the audience. I'll open up right away. Two already, but maybe back to Sarah. So, because uh, we just, you said, and I, I agree with you, I'm also coming from science journalism. We rely on science, but we hear that even in science, of course, sometimes, right? Hashtag reproducibility. Not all studies always are as, I mean, it's a very solid ground, but it's not perfect neither. So, how do you rely on science then? Even that's that's what that's what is interesting in my job because <laughs> if it could be automated, it, it it would have been already. So, <laughs> of course, science is a, a field of um, human knowledge, so it's not perfect. Uh, scientists themselves are not uh, <laughs> cut from the society, uh, but still, what we have to do is talk to, to experts in the field. So that's also why I, I, I found the, 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 the talk from uh, Agathe uh, before very interesting. Uh, we have to, to pay attention as journalists, as science journalists, just to, to reach for the right scientists and not for the experts in one field quite connect, connects, but not exactly this field. So that's very important. But. Um, Maybe, maybe getting back to automation, uh, there, 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 are so there, is, there are also some, uh, some signals, right, uh, which are more like uh, the, the genre of the article. You, you, can say, you, 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 can, you can see it quite, quite quickly when you are a, a professional journalist, if something is uh, coming from a conspiracy website, or, or is, is it uh. coming from, libera li from, I don't know, Le Temps, uh, Libération, Le Monde, or, or the New York Times, or is it coming from... Uh, a website you, you never heard of before. Uh, is there some uh, are there some accusations at the first line in the article? And these are ki kind of um, ki kind of things you can just check very mm -hmm, quickly mm -hmm. if you if you just reading something. Uh, Something written by, by a journalist, yeah. just something on a mediatic level, yeah. But of course, on a scientific level, we have seen cases, right? Uh, some new DNA forms oh, yes. as announced by NASA, uh, particles quicker than light announced by CERN. So, where we science journalists, we don't see it neither because th there has been a real paper behind, right? So, I mean, it's a bit trickier than yes, it, uh, you're right. But maybe I'll open to the to the panel uh, because there's been a question there in the back. Yes, um, thank you. So, my question is about um, more about biased uh, news. Mm -hmm. So we have seen that uh, this kind of fake news, and at least we could somehow verify it, um, that it is fake. But on the other side, I also see that, um, or we, I, I guess we all more or less see that we have this biased um, news, which is not necessarily fake, but it only reveals part of the uh, reality or part of the real story. And I would like to ask, as, as, as a journalist or as scientists, um, what can we do or what are the measures we are taking to deal with um, such biased uh, news? Thank you. Who is the question for? Um, sure. Yeah, maybe any, any of you um, so would like to take it. Actually, um, um, we studied that problem um, in a project funded by one of those, uh, I, me, uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, um, where we collected basically global news at a very large scale and uh, analyzed uh, event coverage. And then we tried to group together the news that have, let's say, similar event coverage, right? And so we had two outcomes. The first one was a very non-surprising finding that, of course, uh, there is some regional cluster. So, of course, news in India report about Indian events and those in Ireland about Irish events. That was not so surprising. Then there was a more unexpected news that there were very strong clusters also that were related to the major media conglomerates in the world, Sinclair and others. 
Uh, and we could even show that uh, once uh, a media acqu was acquired, uh, then they started to align in their coverage, which introduces obviously a bias. Now, whether this is for political or economic reasons, I, ca I can just guess, but it exists. And so then ov an obvious countermeasure is once you understand this, then you can do basically a selection that is not less based on very basic mechanisms, like you say, I'm taking the most popular news, right? Because then you get probably a lot of replication of uh, a few samples from the most popular clusters, but that you try to find news from the different groups of media so that you favor also those that are less popular and that you get more diverse news. And now if you think about the current situation with Ukraine and Russia, this would be extremely important because very few of us probably read the Russian media. I'm, I'm reading it because I just want to see what the other side is saying. Um, uh, and you would get a more complete picture of the world, right? What is true and wrong, that's then a totally different question. Sally, you wanted to elaborate? Uh, yes, I, I can say that we, we all have biases, <laughs> of course, and we have to be aware of it. So um, we as journalists have to have to take, yes, we, we have to be extra careful to our very own bias, biases when covering stories. And I, I cannot say if we succeed in it, but we, we try. And uh, maybe I can give an example of... Um, of biases in uh, studies. I, I remember this lockdown studies during COVID, uh, maybe you too, because there was this huge controversy. Uh, do, do lockdowns work or not? And we had some uh, studies uh, saying yes, to lockdowns work. And we have this uh, very famous professor <laughs> in the US uh, who, who, who was saying no, they didn't work because uh, you know the Great Barrington Declaration, this kind of things. And sometimes that's the problem because we all have biases, uh, journalists can have biases, and their biases, their biases usually appear when they select uh, the stories, uh, when they, 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 they chose to, to speak about something and not something else. And um, scientists can have biases too, and that's what we, we, we've seen with this uh, professor in the United States. So, so that's, uh, that's an ongoing, uh, I, I, don't I don't think we have an easy remedy for it, but uh, we have to be all uh, very um, aware of it. Thank you. There's another question there in the back. I think you have the mic. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Johan. Uh, quick uh, uh, question. I'd like to share with you uh, an experience that uh, I had recently. I attended a, a conference about the metaverse, and I was really skeptical about all this thing, but I just realized that the, there's a whole community and uh, uh, innovation ecosystem around it, and, and is, it will become a reality whether we like it or not. And some guys are developing crazy technology for the metaverse, like this guy developing some kind of airport uh, device that you would put in your ear and that is analyzing your brain, uh, um, how your brain responds to uh, an external stimulation. So basically, if we mix that with um, the capability of artificial intelligence to generate trustworthy person, and we're talking today about an image, but tomorrow if we're talking about an avatar, which will be even more easy for um, an algorithm. Um, and if that avatar is able to understand how you react to what he's saying to you, and then adapt the speech accordingly. So, so sorry, Johan, thank you. What is the question you're asking the audience? How the beyond technology, and I'm, I'm, I'm jumping on, on what you just said, we need more than technology to fight deep fakes. Um, so what do we need more? Okay, yeah, that's a good point, actually, because I also had this on my notes. Technology is both creating the issue, but also solving the issue, yeah. maybe. So uh, for first, uh, uh, just to answer to it, so actually you, you have a good example for, for the metaverse, right? Uh, so what we are seeing today in terms of deep fake video and audios, etc., is just scratching the surface. Just wait in terms of manipulation of information and public opinion. Um, on the day we will all have smart glasses, uh, offered by maybe a major a number of major companies we already know, or maybe some that we don't know, and they will become major. And instead of our mobile phones, we will have these, these smart glasses. And these smart glasses will have a few of us here who won't be uh, present here, but they will look as they are. And uh, they are, of course, um, uh, surrogates of, of the real person behind. 
but how, how can you make sure that these are not surrogates, really truly the surrogates? So in the longer term, the technology is going to become to a point where the problem is going to become worse and worse, right? So even if physically you have something in front of you, you are not sure whether what you are seeing in front of you is actually truly what is the remote doing or not. But this, this maybe some people call it science fiction, so I'm not gonna uh, address that, but you, you got a point that technology also is progressing and, and it's gonna make, make things more, more and more difficult. But beyond technology, I think that there are two uh, very, very, very important things that, that we should also tackle. And uh, uh, like many things in the world, um, uh, often they, are, they lag behind. One is the education and awareness of the phenomenon. That's, that's probably the worst, actually, right? Because a lot of people, uh, it was mentioned by... Um, by the speaker from ICI, uh, uh, Philip Stoll. Uh, yeah, on the on the on the remote. Uh, uh, so, if you are in a in a basement and uh, you do not necessarily uh, have access to 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 the type of information that maybe others have, um, how can you make really true for what is true, what is not true, what is propaganda, what is not propaganda? It's very very very, very difficult, right? And you have the tendency to just believe what you see and what you hear, what you read, right? When you are alone. And it doesn't need to be even in the basement of, um, of, of, of Kiev. Uh, there are countries uh, that are supposed to be even the most powerful uh, in the world. Uh, if you go to some areas of those countries, uh, they, they are not in basement but they are effectively in an environment that you are being fed by all sorts of um, biased, to use the same word, information. And well, you, you, know, you see that and you hear that all, all, all day long and uh, well, it becomes the truth for you, right? So, so I think that beyond um, technology, we have to address, technology is gonna improve, move, it's gonna change things, uh, things become easier and more amazing um, in terms of the impact they can create, et cetera, but at the same time, always, a constant will be that at the end is for humans. And if we do not really also educate ourselves and have awareness that, that, the, that the information is, um, is, is, should be put in question, and not be used uh, as, as, as the truth because you see it or you hear it or so many people are saying it, right? Going back to bias. If 90% of people around you, they say something, it's not it necessarily is true. Scientifics, they know that. Albert Einstein was basically the only person who was talking about relativity and everybody else was saying he's talking about voodoo until it was proven decades later. So, so, so. Bias, what does it even mean, right? So we have to be careful about these things. So this is, I think that education and, uh, and, and awareness is very, very important. This has to start from the younger ages, of course. And I don't think it's necessarily very different from, uh, you know, you cannot just take a car and just drive, right? You have to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe we should start, you know, thinking in terms of access and consumption of information that it's as important as knowing how to drive. Thank you. Yeah, this also came up in the first session, right? Education is key. Maybe we'd like to just we have to close because we're really at the limit of time. But maybe you prepare a, a very short closing statement. I start with you, Sara, and then come to you, Turaj. In the meantime, I ask my last question to Karl because when we had a one-to-one, -one, we we're not just talking about right or wrong or bias, non bias, but about the diversity in general or the richness as a, as, a, as a maybe a way forward. Can you rem remember this this part? So I mean, you, you mentioned a sentence that stayed in my head. It was a. Uh, it's not just about right or wrong, it's about the diversity of information. Yeah, I mean, the right People should, yeah. The right and wrong, I mean, in a sense, uh, I mean, you pointed it essentially out, do not exist, right? They're just agreements uh, among larger and smaller groups of people. And uh, uh, some agreements are, are, are you know, 99% of the world believes that the uh, Earth is a globe, right? Uh, 
uh, but probably now it's no more 99%, it's only 95% and it's decreasing. And uh, <laughs> you, you don't know about it. Uh, interestingly, the same people then use mobile phones, which totally rely on this fact. So. Um, um, I, I think, uh, and then that is for scientific facts, probably it's a little bit easier still than everything that cons concerns societal facts. Uh, it's totally, it's totally, I mean, unclear, right? Uh, there is a huge diversity of possible opinions that can live together and uh, it's not about deciding right and true. I think it's rather about mapping out this universe uh, and to understand what's going on, at least uh, from a more scientific perspective. That's what I hear. Thank you. But very interesting because, uh, of course, truths can be sometimes a bit relative. So there can be many truths. Truths can coexist uh, depending on which side you are. But in the end, you, you can't have everything cannot be relative. relative. You, you have to, to, to trust, to trust the, the media you're reading. So we have to find the best available truth at the moment. And if the if the things change later, they change later, and we 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 are thinking about it too. That's the same in science because there are these scientific paradigms, and sometimes they can change really quickly. Some things we thought was true is not that true anymore, and so that's uh, where I guess science and society meet with the jo journalism as, as, as this bridge in in, in, the in between. <laughs> so that would be my Thank you, answer. Sarah Turaj. Yeah, I'll be short. Uh, I started my talk this this uh, afternoon by saying that uh, don't believe what you see. Necessarily, it's not what it looks. And uh, so be vigilant. The same way as you sometimes read something and you put a question, that a lot of things you can hear and increasingly so, and you can see, are, are maybe not really what they, they are the facts. They are synthetic. They might be manipulated. And uh, it's, 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 it's a good uh, uh, practice to, to, to just uh, question, not, not forward, because, uh, uh, because it, uh, it, it, seems, uh, it seems correct and true. Let's verify before checking. Thanks a lot, Turaj. I'll take you by the word. I won't believe anything you said, all of you. <laughs> and I will tell you now that there is no coffee break, don't believe me, <laughs> which is not until 3.30. <laughs> and if you don't want, please visit also the Wikimedia stand, and we see you at 3.30 for the next session. <laughs>